The Friday the 13th franchise can be divided into two parts, the Paramount years and everything that came after. The Paramount years produced eight movies, seven of them with Jason Voorhees slashing and stabbing and hacking up teenagers years after his mom got the job started. These movies are comfort food for so many horror fans, including myself. Even though we know full and well that most of the movies aren't of the highest of qualities, at least not by traditional standards, we return to them time and time again. It's the familiarity, the predictability, the pure 80s-ness of them. They're so easy to watch. I'm sure plenty of you have seen them each a dozen or so times, and we'll see them a dozen or so more times in the foreseeable future. And when you get together with your fellow horror fanatics, you might find yourself debating which of the movies is the best, and which of them is the worst. The title for the best can always be heatedly debated. Is it the final chapter, which I just covered on Real Slashers? Is the original still the one to beat? But the title for the worst can often be settled fairly quickly. Jason Takes Manhattan. Or, as your friend might quip for the millionth time, Jason takes Vancouver, or Jason takes a cruise ship. Yeah, 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 we know. And of course, this is subjective and there will be votes for part 5. But definitely not either from this writer or this editor. But Jason Takes Manhattan probably gets it on the chin more than any other Friday the 13th movie. And there are legitimate arguments to be made that it deserves the beatings it gets. The claustrophobic boat locale that dominates two-thirds of the movie, the laughable attempt to make Vancouver look like New York, the eye-rolling humor that is frequently attempted. You don't understand, there is a maniac trying to kill us. Welcome to New York. And the ending. Oh boy, that ending. But it remains a fascinating entry in the franchise exactly because of its faults. Not to mention the what might have been factor when you realize it was originally meant to take place in New York City, with insane set pieces we can now only dream about. That's why the Jason flick only a mother could love deserves to be dissected. So let's do an autopsy on the 8th Friday the 13th film and find out what the f*** happened to Jason Takes Manhattan. Let's step back a little bit and see how we got here. In May of 1988, Paramount released Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, to a rather encouraging $8.2 million opening weekend. A very decent opening for the time, especially for a horror franchise into its seventh entry. But the good times didn't last long, as New Blood topped out at the domestic box office with a tad over $19 million which would make it the lowest total gross for the series up until that point. The writing was perhaps on the wall that the series might just be taking its last gasps. But even so, the costs remained so low that the films remained profitable. And so Paramount planned on forging ahead with another film, potentially the last. New Blood's director, John Carl Beekler, had pitched an idea for a follow-up that would once again star Lar Park Lincoln's telekinetic Tina. While Lincoln herself apparently wrote a script with her husband that would find Tina having a job as a psychiatrist for troubled girls. But Paramount evidently had little enthusiasm for revisiting Tina and sought a different direction. That's too bad, I kinda like Tina. Enter Rob Hedden. Hedden was a television writer with credits on MacGyver, and more crucially, the Friday the 13th TV series. Hedden had directed two episodes of the latter show and impressed Paramount. And, as the studio was never one to shy away from newbie directors, the studio approached him with an offer to write and direct the new entry. One of Hedden's original ideas was to have Jason go up against Freddy Krueger, but because of complicated rights issues, there was no way to get that made in a timely manner. So Hedden pivoted in a new direction. In his own words, the director said he wanted to get Jason out of that stupid lake where he's been hanging out. And series executive producer Frank Mancuso was on board. But where would Jason go to? One pitch Hedden came up with involved putting Jason on a boat to, quote, 
put him in the bowels of the ship with a little bit of das boot and a little bit of aliens with a claustrophobic feeling. Another pitch was to do a fish out of water story and take him to a big city. That idea Mancuso responded to, saying New York would be the ideal tourist spot for the undead murderer, and so Hedden was off and running. Unlike the film that we ended up receiving, Hedden's early drafts had Jason truly terrorizing New York City. He was going to have a chase sequence on the Brooklyn Bridge, he was going to fight Julius in Madison Square Garden instead of a rooftop, he'd have more to do in Times Square, he was even going to climb atop the Statue of Liberty and hit up a Broadway show. Can you even imagine? What Hedden might not have realized, or perhaps blocked out of his mind, was that Paramount wasn't willing to foot the bill for such fantastic set pieces. The budget was set around $4 million, so Hedden had to pare things down quite a lot. A story that originally took place in New York for about 75% of the running time was altered to take place predominantly on the ship that sails to New York, allowing Hedden to revive his Jason on a boat idea. Now, the idea was to unleash Jason in the city that never sleeps for only the last third of the movie. Now, naturally, New York is an expensive place to film in, so the decision was made to substitute Vancouver for it, however unconvincingly as that may have been. Still, the budget, which ended up being about $5.5 million by the time production started, was the largest in the franchise's history. Hedden went about assembling his cast and crew. Some would argue the most crucial character in the film is Jason himself, and the initial plan was to go with a stuntman based in Vancouver to wear the hockey mask. The producers apparently thought the prior Jason, Kane Hodder, wouldn't want to return, much to the actor's surprise. Hodder lobbied the producers for the role and succeeded, once again playing everyone's favorite rendition of the hulking, brutal Mr. Voorhees. Intriguingly, some of the actors hired didn't realize they were even making a Friday the 13th movie until they were actually on set. V.C. Dupree, who plays Julius, thought he was making a slasher movie called Ashes to Ashes until right before shooting commenced. Add to that the fact that some of the actors didn't even know how their characters were going to die, instead finding out literally the day of shooting, and you got one secretive movie. With the cast set, filming on the Jason flick commenced in Vancouver, but it quickly hit a snag. A key member of the cast was about to get the axe. Figuratively, of course. An actor named Lee Coleman had been cast in the role of Sean Roberts, who plays our heroine Rennie's boyfriend. Coleman had been cast two weeks prior, but after one day of filming, Rob Hedden knew he had a problem on his hands. The actor just wasn't working out and had no chemistry with his leading lady. After just one day of shooting, Coleman was informed by the producers he was being let go. Soon after, actor Scott Reeves got a call and an offer, and obviously had to hightail it to Vancouver to start shooting ASAP. Also let go? The first ship that Hedden had picked out for the film, a big, impressive vessel that would have looked fantastic on screen. Unfortunately for the director, he found out just three days prior to shooting that a location issue would make it so they could not use the ship that he wanted. For a replacement, he went with a much smaller ship, but found clever ways of filming it so it actually looked much bigger than it was. The scenes on the ship were actually shot out at sea in a place called Horseshoe Bay in West Vancouver. As for how that ship in a lake would find itself in the ocean, it seems as though Hedden and everyone else were just fine with not caring about that. Logic has never been this franchise's strong suit. Filming was not always a thrill for lead actress Jensen Daggett, who had to get used to getting all kinds of soggy throughout the production. But at least she didn't smash her gums on the side of a rowboat like co-star V.C. Dupree did. Of course, Dupree would get his whole block knocked off in the movie's most famous scene, which, as mentioned, was originally supposed to take place in an actual boxing ring at MSG. Oh, what might have been. Though we probably wouldn't have gotten this amazing dumpster gag right after. Eventually, the film gets off the boat and onto the mean streets of... 
Yes, Vancouver. For a series of glum scenes taking place in alleyways and within the supposed New York City sewer, where the toxic waste flows freely. But the filmmaker simply had to have at least one showstopper of a scene take place in the actual Big Apple. So the big moment took place in Times Square, very early in the morning, when the crowds wouldn't be so plentiful. Of course, putting Jason on the mean streets of New York City is still going to attract a crowd, even at 3 in the morning. Kane Hodder had said that the most amazing thing that he's ever done as Jason was standing in the middle of Times Square, in full costume, as hundreds of passerbys stood behind barricades, cheering and calling for him like he was the one-man incarnation of the Beatles. But just as he must in every movie, Jason had to die at the end. Perhaps for the last time. Hedden thought there was a real chance that Part 8 would be the final Friday. And so he tried as best he could to come up with a kill that would eliminate Voorhees from the picture for good. A controversial decision as it turns out. As Hedden came up with that famous wall of toxic waste. That we all know plows through the sewers of Manhattan nightly. Which would turn a skeletal Jason into... Wait, his former young boy self? Huh? How's that work? Is this movie saying that the fountain of youth is in the sewers of New York City? Oh my god. If that's not weird enough, the original ending saw the young boy version of Jason attempting to escape through the mouth of the rotting monster. Yeah, it's as bizarre as it sounds. The production built a gigantic skeleton Jason head and had young Tim Merkovich, who happened to be the son of editor Steve Merkovich, attempt to climb through this ridiculous monstrosity. Obviously, it did not look good whatsoever, so the footage was thankfully scrapped. Kane Hodder was not pleased with the ending to say the least. But he's felt the need in recent years to clear up the rumor that he hates it. I never hated the end of it. Uh, I just thought maybe we could have done something better. But as far as hating it, I never hated it. Most franchise fans might not be so kind. After shooting and editing were done, there would come yet another fight with the MPAA. Nothing new for this franchise. But the fact is that the film wasn't considerably gory to begin with, and didn't have to endure the kind of major cuts that some of the other films, like Part 7, had to. Still, the system was quite puritanical at the time, and the filmmakers had to lose a few scenes that were considered too graphic, as tame as they might seem by today's standards. When it came time to market the movie, Paramount had an easy job. Jason in New York City, nuff said. Their initial poster had the iconic slasher cutting through the equally iconic I Love New York sign. But there were two problems with this. One, the MPAA didn't like the fact that Jason's knife was bloody. And two, the tourism board in New York simply hated the very idea of it and threatened a lawsuit. Paramount obliged and removed the posters that had already gone up, replacing them with Jason menacingly hovering over the New York skyline. What did stick around was a very amusing theatrical teaser showing us a motionless Jason taking a moment out of his day in Brooklyn to stare longingly across the river at Manhattan. That was not Kane Hodder, by the way. Something that also stuck in the actor's craw. Take your best shot, motherfucker. Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, was released in July of 1989, two weeks before the competition in the form of A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5 showed up. The reviews were unfavorable, which was always to be expected, but the box office results were just as tepid. The film opened in fifth place to a tune of $6.2 million, and ultimately wrapped up with a paltry $14.3 million making it the lowest grossing film in the series. Jason was just all washed up. And with that, Paramount quietly ended their association with Friday the 13th, having seen enough evidence that perhaps it was time to bury Jason for good, no matter how pitiful the finale. Of course, The Man in the Mask would be revived only a few years later by New Line Cinema and original director Sean Cunningham. But for many, it was the end of an era. Jason's Paramount years had concluded after almost a decade. 
and for the Friday the 13th faithful, those are the only movies that really count. As for Jason Takes Manhattan's overall legacy, well, we're still talking about it today, aren't we? No matter how misguided and silly it may have turned out, the fans of the series are a forgiving bunch, and though it may arguably be the low point for the Paramount years, it oddly still holds a place in many of our hearts. I know it does mine. You're dead, fucker.